Hey guys, welcome to my first in a series of video tutorials about Blender where I try to go over the stuff that isn't necessarily covered in a lot of other, other tutorials and just kind of general stuff that I really appreciate about Blender that might not have been, you know, might not be advertised a lot in other videos and stuff like that, uh, not talked about as often. Generally, like the philosophy of Blender, how to, how to learn it yourself uh, from scratch like I did over the last couple years and um, just what to keep in mind when uh, working on stuff. So let's get right into it. I'm going to I'm going to select everything here by hitting A and hit H to hide it. I'm going to turn off the axes. I'm going to turn off the floor for a second and I'm going to hide. Actually, I'm going to move the 3D cursor over here by just holding shift and right clicking to dra uh, dragging it over here um, just for later use. So I'm going to grab my annotation tool. I'm going to hide my tools and um, and just kind of start by talking about what this uh, video tutorial series is going to really be touching on. So first and foremost, uh, the Blender philosophy, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make this kind of a an ongoing thing throughout all the videos. But essentially, I think Blender is unlike a lot of other um, 3D modeling apps in that. Well, it's, it's totally free and it really is a, a good competitor with a lot of the big leagues out there, like Maya and Autodesk. Um, but I think the fact that it's free means there's tons of great resources out there that just aren't possible with stuff like 3ds Max, Maya, um, other big names because the entry, the, the cost of entry is nothing. And so anybody can be creating content for Blender and there is so much content out there for Blender. Um, and I think that's a huge plus because anytime you want to know something, you don't know how to do something or you want to, you don't want to have to make a material from scratch or make a model from scratch. Somebody's probably already done something out there that you can find for yourself. So that's one big plus. So the fact that it's free, uh, means tons of resources. Um, and I'm using a tablet here just to, just so you know uh, to write this down. But for the rest of like the modeling portion of this tutorial, I will be using a mouse and keyboard, so don't worry about that. Um, it's adaptable, meaning um, you can make it work for you as opposed to you working for it. Um, it's just easy to you easy w when you when you have. When you've set it up to your liking, it's easy to work in. Um, I find with, I, I learned 3D modeling with 3ds Max and I felt like I was always having to adapt to 3ds Max's um, structure and sort of having to do things in the Autodesk way as opposed to doing it the way I wanted to do it. So I think that's the adaptability, the customizability of the interface, of the shortcuts, of every aspect of, of Blender's workflow, you can customize it. I think that's a huge plus. Um, flexible tools. Um, and I'll, this is a big thing that I'll be touching on today is um, the flexible tools, primarily the 3D cursor, uh, which is a huge thing that often goes overlooked, I find, in a lot of other tutorials. You know, people use it here and there, but they don't, they don't really talk about all the advantages of using the 3D cursor and how that can speed up your workflow a ton. Um, such as 3D cursor. Um, and, and just stuff like the annotation tool that I'm using right now, like just being able to sort of draw and add notes and things like that. And then later on, you can go into your tools, uh, your, your view annotations and just kind of, um, and just kind of turn this on and off for later use. So stuff like that, um, little tools here and there that just together form a really good package of, of, of things for you to have access to when working on a model or whatever you're working on. Um, and finally, the file system. So Blender has this great system where the file format um, dot blend the .blend file, when you go and navigate to, let's say I want to add something from another file that I've worked on, another Blender file, you can append and then navigate to, I've already navigated here, but essentially if I go to my Blender projects here, all my Blend files, and if I just go to, I was working on this rocket nozzle thing a while back, so if I go and click on, double click on that, it opens up this 
kind of folder structure. And this is everything in my Blender file. Um, so I can go to my materials, I can pull a material that I already made from the, my Blend file, I can go to my meshes, I can pull um, a mesh from another file, or an object, or a collection, or whatever you want. You can grab stuff from other Blend files without having to export, without having to you know, go back and forth between the files. Uh, I think it's a huge strength to be able to reuse stuff that you've worked on. Um, you know, I often go back to a lot of test files that I worked on just to grab materials that I made in there as opposed to having to remake them. So I think that's a huge plus. Um, and I'll be touching on all of these sort of briefly throughout the series and throughout this video, but it's really, I want to focus the series on a lot of the unspoken things in Blender. So um, I am just going to go into my annotations and hide this. I'm going to switch back to my uh, cursor. And this tutorial is meant for anybody who's getting into, wants to get into using Blender for either 3D modeling or other projects. It's just meant to be sort of an introductory, like, why Blender over other things? What makes Blender appealing um, to somebody who's never used a 3D modeling program before, but also maybe somebody who has used other modeling programs that doesn't really understand what the big deal is. Um, so I'm going to try to show that off um, to the best of my abilities. So today we're going to be making, um, well, I will show you. I am going to add our reference image. So I'm going to hit Shift A on my 3D viewport here. Uh, and I'm using Blender 2.091, by the way. It says so in the bottom right here. And um, I just loaded up the default settings, so if you're running Blender 2.91, you'll have the exact same settings as I have right here. Um, before I continue, though, I do want to change one preset, so I'm going to go into Edit Preferences and to Key Map, and I'm going to change my spacebar action to a search function instead of play, because we're not going to be doing any animating today. Um, and I generally just prefer having the search on the spacebar because it's much more accessible. Um, and if there's any shortcuts you're looking for, you can just go into um, here and search for it. So, for example, if I wanted to know what the move tool shortcut was, you can just search move. And it will show you all of the shortcut shortcuts whose name has move in them and then it will show you th those keyboard shortcuts if there is any and you can reassign them if you like uh, you can assign them to your mouse if they're on your keyboard vice versa it's super flexible so feel free throughout the process to you know make your own shortcuts if you're not happy with the default ones so that being said i'm going to hide my tools by hitting t um, i'm going to hide my right side view by hitting n and we are just going to add, I'm going to switch over to my mouse also, my, instead of my tablet, just so, because I'm more familiar with modeling with my mouse. And I'm going to add a, um, an image. Now, I could add a reference or a background image, but I know there's another, uh, there's another way to add an image. There's an add-on. If I go into my preferences add-ons and search for image, there's an import images as plain. So that I tend to like that one better because they act more as normal objects as as opposed to reference images. So now I, when I add, I have this images as planes option. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to navigate to my desktop. Uh, I, be, I thought it was on my desktop. Oh, yes. And I'm going to take in my image, import as planes. And you could already see that now my image got imported to where my 3D cursor is. We could already see the usefulness of a 3D cursor. So I'm gonna move my 3D cursor by hitting Shift S. I'm gonna bring up this quick menu. I'm gonna move my cursor to the world origin, which is the center where these axes meet up. And I'm gonna hit Shift S again and do selection to cursor. So that's gonna move my, whatever I have selected, I had that croissant uh, image selected as a reference. So it's gonna move it to my 3D cursor. Now I'm going to hit period to center my view on the uh, plane. And you're going to say, well, I don't see an image there. Well, it's because we're in uh, the viewport shading, which essentially does not use any textures at all. It's just flat colors. Um, but I can make it such that it shows the texture here by just going into the drop down menu for viewport shading and select making the color be the texture. So now I'm going to rotate this image. So I'm going to hit R 
and you can see when I hit R, it's rotating around the um, wherever the dotted line is 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 uh, going to. So my cursor changes to these arrows, indicating the direction in which the rotation is occurring, and it's showing me where I'm rotating around. So if I didn't want to rotate around the view like this, I mean, I could also orient my view such that you know, if I want to rotate it sideways, I can go to the side view and rotate it this way. Um, to do that, I'm holding Alt, and then I'm middle mouse clicking and dragging in the direction that I want to sort of flip the view to. So if I wanted to go to the y-axis here, um, like align to the y-axis, I would hold Alt, and then I would click drag sort of in this direction. And what that looks like is kind of like this. Uh, some people don't like that, so you can also just click up here and it will align it to whatever axes you want. So a lot of people like this kind of gizmo setup instead of having to navigate with using middle mouse like other 3D programs. Um, you can you can move like this, you can pan with this button, you can zoom in with this button. Um, you can view what the camera sees. Um, so you can use, do all of this up here, but I just find it way faster using the mouse. And with the mouse, it's uh, middle mouse to rotate, shift middle mouse to pan, control middle mouse to zoom in. Um, so I'm going to select this image. We're going to rotate it on the Y axis. So I, I select it, I hit R to rotate, and then I hit Y and it just restricts it to the Y axis. And then if I hold control now, it sort of, you can see it snaps to uh, degrees. And at the top left up here, you can see what the rotation, how many degrees there are. So I'm, I'm just going to hit, I'm just going to click the, um, type in the numbers 90. And you can see now that's, it's input that as a, as a degree rotation. Uh, and I'm going to hit enter to confirm that. So you can see already a lot of, a lot of Blender is shortcuts and uh, using a combination of mouse, contextual positions, and keyboard shortcuts to do things. And that can be really overwhelming. Like I already have just shown you a ton of stuff, so I, I, I can see how a lot of people get really intimidated by this. But again, you don't have to do, this is like pro level strats, right? Like you don't have to be doing this um, level of, of crazy, quick manipulation. It's just the more comfortable you get in Blender, the easier it is to do things extremely quickly. And the program really doesn't hold you back in terms of how quickly you want to move, which I very much enjoy. So, um, so like, as I said, you can use these gizmos and stuff to navigate, but I would try to get used to just moving with the mouse and keyboard. Um, so I always have my hand, my left hand resting on the left side of the keyboard around where the WASD keys are. And so my pinky is on the control and shift keys. And then my other fingers are sort of in the middle of the keyboard uh, jumping around to various shortcuts that I have. So as I said, before we get into modeling stuff, I'll just go into a bit of like the other, the full description of what this kind of shortcuts can do. So G is um, grab. I, I always think of it as grab. So G is to move things around. So when you hit G, uh, whatever you have selected gets sort of locked to your cursor and you can move it around. While you're in this mode, Again, you can hit, you can hold control and it will sort of snap to uh, whatever your snapping settings are. So in this case, it's snapping to increments. And you can see that by up here, you see our snapping is, uh, it's turned off. And that's why normally it's not snapping, but when I hit hold control, it sort of enables it. And that's a two way thing where now if I enable it and, and move it, and now it's snapping automatically. But if I hold control, it goes back to being, um, to being free moving. And you can enable and disable snapping by just hitting shift tab. And that will, um, although the, the icon color doesn't change, it, it will if I if I cancel now, you see it's disabled. So you can easily enable or disable that by just hitting shift tab. So I'm gonna disable it. Um, so yeah, that's this is grab, R is rotate, as I said. S is scale. And I believe that's it for now. So, so each of these ha you can sort of restrict the movement to whatever you need. So in, in this case, if I grab, you can see it's moving based on the screen position, like the direction I'm looking at, right? 
But if I wanted it to be constricted to the X and Y plane, these uh, colored lines, like basically the ground, I could hit Shift Z. And what that does is when you hit Shift and a, a letter of the three axes, either X, Y, or Z, what that does is it restricts um, movement to the other two axes. So if I hit Shift Z, you can see now it's restricting it to the X and Y. If I hit Shift Y, it restricts it to the um, X and Z. If I hit Shift X, it restricts it to the Z and Y. Uh, so that's a really nice way of, of restricting the movement of something. And the same can be done if you just hit a letter of one axis. So if I hit G and X, you can see now it's only moving it on the X. If I hit Y now, it, it's only moving on the Y. And if I hit Z, it's only moving on the Z. So that's basics of 3D manipulation, moving objects around and stuff like that. Okay, so we're going to start getting into modeling now, I think. Um, oh, and all of these rules also apply to rotation. Uh, so if I hit R and then X or Y or uh, X, Y and things like that, all of those apply. Same goes for scaling. So scaling, normally because this is a plane, I can only really scale it on one axis. But if I hit X now, you can see it's only scaling on the X axis. So a lot of all these shortcuts are very contextual so and it's also based on where my cursor is so if I hit G over here right I'm moving but if I hit G over on on this area while my cursor is over here it doesn't do anything because when you hit when you use shortcuts they're dependent on where your cursor position is your cursor position is kind of where you're looking so in this case because I'm my cursor is in this this window the shortcuts are being applied in the 3d view um, and each each area sort of has shortcuts that can or can't be used um, in that way. And that's where a lot of people get intimidated by like, how do I know where to use what? And it's like a lot of these shortcuts can be used in multiple places. And when they, when they can, uh, they're consistent, right? So G is grab. That is also the case for any other place where you can sort of manipulate and move stuff around. G will also be grab. So if I just quickly jump over uh, to my work um, workspace here, if I jump to shading, what I will see is my 3D viewport up here, but it's set up sort of in a more, um, it's, it's set up to sort of check textures a bit more. And down here we have nodes. You don't need to know about any of this. I'm just demonstrating the keyboard shortcuts. So as you can see, if I select uh, one of these nodes, these little boxes, I can then hit G and move them around much like I can in the 3D viewport. So a lot of these shortcuts are sort of like, they, they are consistent across um, areas um, for the most part. So back to our layout, uh, we haven't even started making our croissant yet, so we should get onto that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate my view to be uh, aligned to the Z axis. So I'll just click here. It's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And we're going to be modeling one of these croissants and we're going to use the image to give it a texture as well. Um, just a really simple, um, this is a free you know, stock photo that I, I found online and just a really quick example of how you can use how you can model something how to use textures with that object we're going to get into a bit of uh, sh shading nodes and things like that um you know general tools on how to model and maybe a bit of modifiers as well depending on on how this goes so i have not modeled this uh croissant before i'm just like this is a completely uh, improvisational kind of system because I, I want to walk you through my process when modeling something because a lot of the process is troubleshooting trying things out maybe they don't work maybe they do um, you you have to be able to experiment with stuff and just try things because if you don't try anything you're never gonna do anything right and like um, I've often gotten caught in I'm scared of doing the wrong thing or the right thing and I end up doing nothing right a, a lot of a lot of getting stuff done is trying and failing and then learning from that failure and moving forward so we are going to be modeling one of these croissants and to start with I am going to make sure that my image stays put because I don't want to actually accidentally move it or scale it or do anything like that it's very easy when you're working with background images to like accidentally select the image and then you move it and um, so what I'm gonna do is up here in my outliner view um, 
You can see it's the outliner just from here. Uh, this top little left box, it shows what type of window this is. So I'll just briefly talk about these three win default windows that are open. Actually four, there's the timeline uh, down here, but we're not going to use that. Um, each of these windows you can see has a little drop down menu at the top left. And what that is, it, def it defines what that window is doing, but also you can click it and change any of these windows to any other type of window. So in the case of here, I could change this to a 3D viewport. And then if I hit period to zoom in on my reference image, now I have a similar, um, a similar smaller viewport here of my 3D scene. I don't want that right now, um, but you know you can. It mean it means this this kind of thing is what I think is so strong in Blender, is that you can set up your workspace however you want. Um, you know you can make this your main viewport if you're focused on something over here, and then you can bring this back over. You can switch up here to all these pre-made workspaces and you can even add your own so just a little taste of like if you want to make blender your own you can really go to town with making um with redefining these windows and if you want to add a window you can just hover over any corner of these top bars and you get this little cross and when you get this cross you can click and drag and you split your window basically and if you're not happy with the split you can right click and it'll just cancel it but in this case like if I want to split vertically you just pull down um, if you want to collapse two windows that are adjacent you can either right click up between them and say um, join and then you get this arrow defining how they're gonna join so in this case the bottom one will override the top one or you could also do the similar thing of finding a cross clicking and then dragging towards one that you want to collapse it to so just a little, uh, little tip on how to maybe lay out your, your UI. Okay, so let's get to modeling. Uh, so I'm going to switch this back to the outliner. outliner. And here we see we have our croissant. Uh, I'm going to write reference or ref. And I'm going to bring down this little drop down. And here we have other little toggles that we can enable. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable the selectable toggle and now you can see all our objects have this little toggle and I'm going to make this object not selectable. So now I cannot select it, I can't move it if I wanted to. I have to go back in here and enable this if I want to move it. So that's great. Um, I'm going to add now a mesh. So just all these primitive objects. Um, you know, when you start modeling something, it's best to pick something that is already close to what you're trying to make. In this case, croissant, I think I'm going to start with a plane and you'll see why in a bit. Um, so already there's a problem now. Why is my plane not in front of my reference? Because uh, I want to be able to sort of line things up. Well, if I sort of rotate my view, you can see that it's it's sort of, they're sort of intersecting. There's a bit of a problem there. So I'm going to just hit G to grab and then Z to slide it up the Z axis. And I'm just going to make it slightly above it. And then I'm going to, uh, I want to make this smaller. So I'm going to S to scale. I'm just scale it down. And now if I go to my Z um, viewport, I'm going to just grab and move it to hmm, which one will be easiest to model. Let's Let's do this one, it, it looks pretty. So I'm gonna move it over here. I'm gonna rotate it to sort of sort of be roughly in line with maybe the center of it. And from here, we're gonna get into modeling. So I'm gonna hit tab to switch my mode from object mode to edit mode. There's also all these modes that we'll get into maybe at a later video series, but uh, for now, I'm just gonna hit edit mode. And now we have these three little boxes that pop up we can select vertices, edges, or faces. And you can also select multiple at once, uh, but I'm not gonna get too much into that because for the most part, I only select one type at any given time. So in vertices mode, you're selecting the points at which edges intersect here. When you select edges, you're you know, selecting the edges of faces. And when you're in faces, you're selecting the faces or polygons on the mesh. So 
to start with, this square is definitely not the shape of a croissant. So how am I going to make this the right shape? Well, I'll show you a number of different ways to do that. So to extrude things, uh, you hit E and then uh, you can just extrude it. Now it's sort of stuck to my mouse. Um, I can click to place it and then, you know, it, it keeps the newly extruded edge uh, selected and I could just keep doing that. Uh, so in this case, if I wanted to sort of model this croissant roughly, I could, you know, extrude it and then, oh, this edge is a bit too big, so I'll just scale it down and I'll move it here. And then I'll do the same thing, extrude, scale, extrude, scale, extrude, scale, extrude, scale. And I'm gonna do I'm gonna do this like generally throughout the the shape just really quick. Extrude scale, extrude scale. And you're probably thinking, well, how is this gonna become a 3D model? Well, or you may not be wondering that, but if you are, uh, I will I will show you soon enough. Patience. Um, but I'm also gonna show a number of uh, methods on how to do this because that's the thing with 3D modeling. There. Um, isn't and in my opinion shouldn't be a quote-unquote best way of doing something there are just many different ways and depending on your skill set how you're comfortable modeling all that stuff uh, you got to find the method that works best for you and for the circumstance in which you're you're creating the model right like if I'm if this is just a prop for in the background of a video game or something I'm not going to be spending that much time on it so maybe I'm going to take the quicker method even though it's maybe not the the best looking method or whatever and vice versa if this is like a prop that a main character in a video game is holding in their hand uh, you kind of want it to be really nice and maybe you want to make it uh, you want to go all out with the details so Okay, so that's uh, that's my general outline for my croissant. Um, if you want to see but through your model, you can also enable this X-ray view. Although already this is not necessarily the best way to view it, so I'm going to very quickly just show off um, when you have your object selected. If you go into um, your object properties, you can go into the viewport display section and you can display it uh, in a number of different ways. So in this case, um, let's say I want to display it as textured. Uh, I don't know if this will, mm, no, no, it still does not show properly. Solid, no. Um, so in this case, you know, if I, if I did want, um, it, 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 this is basically the same kind of idea as, as enabling the textured thing here, but you can make, make it such that it, you know, if you have a mesh that is doing something specific that you don't really need to see that much, you can toggle the visibility in the viewport display settings. So in this case, um, my, my image is kind of dark when I turn on my x-ray view, which I'm not super happy about. Um, but I'm not going to get too much into that right now. I think if you, if, if you were to add a a reference image this might become less of a problem but I just find that reference images are a bit more difficult to manipulate you know what let's just add it just to see let's see since I'm, I'm doing this on the fly you're you're able to experience the the way I get distracted uh, normally too so yeah maybe actually this reference is better maybe I should uh, I should be using this because the colors seem a lot more vibrant and if I go into x-ray yeah it's still visible so I should have been using reference all the time. I told you lies. Um, okay, so we're just gonna line this guy up. Oops. Rotate him. Uh, why does that not line up? Oh, it's because it's it's mirrored in the other direction. That's why. So I'm just gonna rotate it over the y axis. Oh, I'm so I'm gonna rotate it over the y axis, which is this green line. So I'm gonna hit R, and then I'm gonna type in 180 so that's rotating it 180 degrees but this is still not correct oh that's why because I was rotating on the on the wrong axis there we go okay so I'm gonna put this here and that looks close enough I'm gonna delete my croissant ref um, I have to have it selectable so that I can delete it. I can 
select and delete it and now I have this guy in its place okay so little segues like that happen all the time for me um, you know something's not working quite right you got to tweak it uh, it's part of the process it's normal and like you can't get away with not doing that right there was there will be times when things don't work um, you're gonna have to deal with it and then keep working on whatever you're working on without getting too off track so I'm gonna go back to my plane and now that I'm you know this is looking sort of something like something else than a plane so I'm gonna call it a croissant uh, mesh okay so we're gonna select our croissant mesh we're gonna go back to edit mode and now we can see like in a bit more detail we can line things up a little better and this doesn't have to be perfect because again I'm just gonna do sort of one rough uh, example of how you could make this if it was some kind of background croissant and you can see like I'm just box selecting um, there's a lot of other selection tools that are very handy one of which that I really like is the circle select tool so if you hit C uh, you'll enter circle select mode and then you kind of just paint a selection in uh, but you can also change the size with the mouse wheel which is very handy if you want to you know select big chunks of something really fast and you could also middle click to deselect so it's very handy for just getting a quick selection of something um, and then you you can right click to edit that selection mode um, you can also hit um, W which is uh, basically the selection tool but as you can see if I hit W it will change the type of selection so you can also do a, a loop selection so it makes this kind of loopy thing um, box select and circle select so circle select is you know it's it's the tool but when you right click it won't go away it's 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 kind of permanently there and the middle click doesn't deselect so it's slightly different than just hitting the C key um, so I, I tend to have just the, the the select box selected at all times um, and now that I see that all these tools are here it's a good time to go over again you don't have to use the shortcuts right you can use just this menu of tools to do things so instead of extruding like I was doing with the edges here you can do extrude region and then you get this handy little um, little draggy thing but in this case what's happening is it's extruding along the normal and the normal is perpendicular to this face so what it's actually doing is it's extruding it vertically which is not what we want so if we wanted to use this tool we would have to switch you know to extrude and then uh, XYZ and then now we get sort of more specific like little thingies to pull out and we can pull them out that way uh, but again the problem is like this is a bit it gets in the way I find it's really easy to start getting your view kind of crowded with stuff so I tend to prefer the shortcut method um, and I find it a bit faster than having to like get your mouse right on a particular point so maybe this is a good time to talk about snapping as well so the snapping tool is up here it's defaulted to increments but I prefer usually vertex edge or volume which means that the selection that you're moving or scaling or whatever will default to um, will will snap to those elements so in this case like I have my vertex selected here I'm gonna turn snapping on and now if I move it and move it over to a vertice within a region it'll snap and it'll indicate where it's snapping to with that little orange circle um, and you could also see here at the bottom of the screen there's a whole bunch of contextual actions uh, that show up that show you what keyboard shortcuts do what in this given context um, so and you could see here in this example that my cursor defines where it's snapping to so if I put my cursor over this area let's say this vertex this is the vertex I want to snap to so I just hit G and immediately my selection jumps to that area because that's where my cursor is right now uh, and as you can see when I move away the vertex stays at the same distance away from my cursor that it was when I hit G to begin with um, so this can be frustrating at 
first if you don't know what's actually happening, but it's very useful when you do know what's happening. So now if I hit shift, which essentially just moves things in smaller increments, and this applies to menus as well, to scaling, to, to all sorts of things. Whenever you're in this mode of like manipulating an object or a slider or anything, if you hold shift down, it will move it at smaller increments. And this can allow you to reposition your cursor to a better location depending on what you're doing or what you want to be doing. So in this case, you know, oh, I'm snapping to this by accident, I can just shift move away and then I can keep moving my vertice without having to worry about it snapping to anything. I can move it up here and stuff like that. And again, you can always right click to just cancel any action that you're currently trying to do. Um, okay, so let's finish modeling this darn croissant. So we're gonna add, um, in this case, I'm just gonna show you a very straightforward method of, of sort of completing this. So I'm gonna select all my faces. I'm gonna turn off X-ray mode so you can better see what's happening. And so I'm gonna select all my faces and I'm gonna extrude them. So I'm gonna hit E. And again, you can see now that I'm snapping to the mesh. It's a bit annoying. So I'm just gonna hold control and that's gonna override my snap settings. I could also just turn it off by hitting shift tab and that also works to keep it um, to keep it turned off. So I'm just gonna raise it by oh I don't know about this this much. And um, so now we have this thick sort of platform. And um, since the croissant obviously you know gets it tapers inward from the edges to the top, I'm going to now scale this and just roughly kind of scale it inward. Maybe I'll check it on the X-ray. Um, you know, I could, I, I would like to scale it along, along, let me, let me just bring my annotation tool. I would like to scale it along, um, along this axis, right? But Right now, I'm I'm oriented this way, where Y is this way, X is this way. So there's not really a super easy way to scale it this way, uh, unless you use the, um, the 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 transform orientation. So essentially, what this means is whatever transformation you're doing, um, you can give it a sort of context to what it's translating relative to. So in this case, global is using my global X, Y, and Z um, vectors. Whereas if I switch to local, um, in this case, I mean, this object, I believe maybe, oh, see, okay, good. That's a great example. So because I rotated my cube to sort of fit this croissant's orientation more or less, now my local orientation, if you can see when I press Y, it's already sort of aligned with how I want it to be, which is good. Um, but if that weren't the case, um, you what you could do is you could say, well, okay, um, this face is kind of in the orientation that I want, right? It's, it's already sort of lined up this way. So maybe I'll just select this edge, one of these edges. I know that this corner is the relative direction I want my my axes to be in. So you could go into your transform orientations and add a new one. And now this edge is being used to define uh, how things are being transformed. So now if I select um, this area and if I control click, uh, control clicking, as you can see down here, it picks the shortest path between two faces. So um, if I were to select this guy and then control click here, it's, it goes along the edge because that's the shortest path between those two faces. So I'm going to control. I'm going to click here and then control click this other guy to select all these faces. And then I'm going to scale along the X or Y, and you can see that using that edge produces a very similar result, whereby it's scale. It's now shifting the the restricting axes to that edge orientation. So I'm just going to get rid of that because essentially it's the same as local. So I'm going to keep using local. And uh, so now we have this mm, sort of tapered shape. It's getting to look more like a croissant, sort of. And I'm going to do the same, pro repeat the same process, extrude vertically, and then scale along the y-axis, scale along the x-axis, and scale just proportionally. 
Um, but then we kind of run into a problem in this version, right? Where the top face is always going to be sort of flat. Um, so a quick way I'm going to fix that. Again, this is a, just one example, a very messy example of how you could do this. And I will show you another method soon enough. But I'm going to select this edge and then I'm going to enable proportional editing. And what that does is, you will, as you will see, um, is if I get it set up properly. Um, so normally when you start proportional editing, you'll get this circle and you'll you'll see that like you're sort of dragging your selection out and it's dragging stuff with it. So using your mouse wheel, you can define how wide your area of effect is in your selection. So if I roll it all the way down, I'm just pulling this edge. It's not doing anything else. When I roll it up, it starts dragging sort of stuff in the adjacent area along with it. And this is a good way of just making very s slight sort of variations in curvature of things very easily. And you can change the fall off curve of what this is. So if I now flip it to sharp, what will happen is you can see I get like the sharp edge as opposed to a more smoothed edge. Um, so I'm just going to keep the smooth and I'm going to click and drag and move it upward just to get a slight curve out of it. And now the problem is that the bottom of my croissant is all curved too. I, I don't want that. I want it to be, let's say at this point in time, I want it to be flat. So what I'm going to do is um, maybe I'll just hide my reference for a second. I'll just hit the little eye icon to hide it. I'm going to go to the bottom of the croissant, click, uh, control click to select this whole area. And then I'm going to hit S to scale. Oh, but my proportional editing is still on, so I'm going to right click to cancel that and turn it off up here. I think you can hit O as the shortcut, yeah, for proportional editing. So if you hit O, it toggles that on and off. Um, so I'm going to scale these faces in the Z axis and I'm going to make them zero so that they're just flat. And then I'm going to just drag this down a bit um, and maybe. Maybe I want I want this this loop edge to sort of be a bit lower, but I don't want to have to you know if I move it just vertically it changes my shape a lot. I don't really want that, so I'm gonna try to slide it along the edge. And to do that, all you have to do is after you hit G, you just hit G again, and then you get these little uh, white, um, yellow indicators sort of showing you how it's sliding along the edge. Uh, and you can see that if I go lower, it's sliding sort of along this angle. And if I go higher, it's sliding along this angle. So I'm just going to slide it a bit lower. And I think that's looking good. And I am I think I need another sort of division along here so that I can get a bit more of a natural curve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit Control R uh, to ring cut. And you can see that by the preview what it's going to do it's going to add a, sort of an, an edge around a loop like that and you can scroll your mouse up to add multiple of these you can add however many you want potentially and you can scroll your mouse wheel down to get rid of them so i'm going to add one here and why not i'm going to add one here too and i'm just going to slightly scale them so i'm going to hit s but i find this is a little too jittery, so I'm gonna hit uh, hold shift now to get a more incremental um, incremental control. And same for this uh, S, and then shift to move it slightly. And this is looking a, a little bit more natural now, a little bit more like maybe a croissant. Um, this loop, I can see that it's a bit, the, the spacing is a bit different, so I'm just gonna scale it a bit more in the X axis. Maybe just rotate it slightly to give a bit of a uneven sort of look. And now to do something I think about this top area. Um, I'm going to also add a loop cut through the top like this. And that's so that I can, now if I go into vertex mode, I'm going to just select this single vertex. I'm going to enable my proportional editing again. And maybe I will just make it connected only so that it doesn't, it's not as influential to these unconnected areas of the model. So I'm just gonna pull this middle up slightly and then I'm gonna select a bit more and do the same kind of 
thing. Maybe select these side guys, just to sort of bring a bit of variation to this. And you know what? I'm going to change this to random. Instead of smooth, what random does is it sort of moves all of the you know, all of your selection in different random uh, amounts as you can see by this jittering as I as I move it forward or back and I kind of like the fact that it's pulling all these other vertices out in different ways too but I'm gonna keep it kind of small and uh, you know I'm gonna just select a couple of points because yeah it really gets to be a lot if you're not careful um, so our croissant is looking a little uh, rough, but it's getting there. Um, and the reason we can see the faces right now is because it's it's being shaded flat. Uh, we're going to change it to shade smooth, and that'll just kind of smooth out all those edges. And we can kind of still see the edges, but we'll fix that a bit later as well. So um, why don't we texture this guy? Because I think this is probably the worst way to do this, but it's definitely... Um, one way. So we're gonna just quickly do texturing to show off what that can what that can be like. So we're gonna use our image texture to do the texture to apply the texture of the croissant onto it. Um, and to do that, maybe I'll just add a quick bottom to this to this so that it's not perfectly flat. That it's like a little bit more than a plastic croissant. So I'm going to, instead of just extruding, I'm going to hit I to inset. And that will just, as you can see, sort of put a, f a set of faces on the inside of the selected faces. And then I'm going to hit G to grab. I'm going to turn off this proportional editing again. G to grab, Z to move it along the Z axis, and then bring it down a bit, just so we have that little lip all along the edges there. OK. So we're going to go into our UV editing tool now. And UVs, for those of you who don't know, are essentially how the how 3D programs define where images are applied to textures. So I just quickly show you, um, if I select some faces on this, uh, on this croissant, you'll see that on the left here, um, certain faces appear, depending on what I'm selected. Now right now I don't have sync turned on, so I'm gonna I'm gonna turn on sync, and now you can see that all the faces are visible. And as I select them, certain ones will highlight as they're being selected here. So if I select everything, all of them are selected. Um, you probably won't notice this right away, but this is not how it's supposed to look. So <laughs> what I'm gonna do is just do a quick UV. Um, so I'm gonna hit spacebar to search going to write UV and then you get all the the properties of UV here so or all the available things that have UV I'm going to do a smart UV project which essentially it it lays out the UV uh, the UVs as best as it can automatically and it gives you some of these settings so the angle limit is essentially how much the angle has to be for it to split up these UVs and you'll see what I mean if I just hit OK so you see it breaks up these UVs. Um, so I'm just selecting by clicking, but then if you want to select an entire piece that's, that's joined or that's, that's a single piece, you can hover over it and just hit L and it will select um, all the pieces connected to that. So on a normal mesh like this, um, if I hit L over it, it will just select everything because all of the faces are connected. But in the UV view, because these are different islands as they're called um, they're separate and so hitting L will just like um, like the one so the bottom is something that we don't really care that much about so we're gonna move it out of our UV box here and uh, to, to get an idea of how our things are gonna be laid out let's just add our croissant picture right and now things are a little distorted, so let's just go ahead and redo that smart UV project. Um, oh, they're still distorted, of course, because... So UVs are usually square, and so what this is doing is because the image is is not square, it's also distorting the, the UVs, uh, which is not necessarily something we want, but we're just going to have to deal with it. 
like everything else. So we are going to move these off to the side. And I think the easiest way to do this is just to use the projection. So I'm just going to select everything. I don't think these automatic UVs are going to be useful in this circumstance because we're going to have to distort them to match this image, which is not what we want. So what I'm going to do is just select everything. And in the 3D viewport, I'm going to hit spacebar and I'm going to write project, project from view. So what this is going to do, you're going to see, is it's going to project what I'm looking at right now in the 3D viewport to my UVs. And it's still distorted, but in this case, it's just one object, so we don't have to deal too much with um, fitting it. We just kind of have to, um, we just kind of have to, you know, manipulate it a bit to get it sort of matching the shape of this guy. Um, so I'm going to rotate it, scale it along the x-axis, maybe scale it along the x-axis this way so that it's a bit more croissant shaped. And we just kind of sort of try to approximate it. Um, oh, but I think this is our croissant actually. It's not that one. It's this one. So we're going to sort of approximate it to be over our croissant. And maybe we could, let's just project it from the bottom. Since our image is, is flipped, we're just going to project uh, our UVs in the other direction and flip it that way. And then scale it this way. Scale it Y. And And this is very messy, so excuse me for that, but um, you know, I'm gonna turn on my proportional editing in here. I'm gonna make it sphere, and I am going to turn mm, off connected only, and that'll give me a better way to manipulate these. So I'm just sort of pushing around the vertices to get them sort of to fit in the general in the general shape of the croissant so that we can have our textures applied. And you may still be asking, why are we doing this? I don't know what, um, but you'll see. Um, essentially, the reason we're lining up our geometry in this sort of flat 2D view is because our this is how our textures will be projected. And now if I quickly switch over to textured view, um, and I go over here, make a material, just a really simple, it's a basic material. And then I add for the color, I'm going to add an image. And we already have our image in the file, so we're just going to hit this little drop down. And we're going to select croissant. Ta da! It's a croissant. Uh, we're going to turn down the specular so that it's not shiny like that. We're going to turn up the roughness. Maybe actually we're going to turn up specular just a little bit because when it's rough, that sheen kind of gets a little softer. <clears throat> so there's our very basic croissant. And as you can see on the bottom, it's just the same texture. It's because in our UVs, um, our bottom and our top are on the same spot on the image, essentially. So what it's doing, if uh, I'll select, let's say, this face here, you can see that this face on the image corresponds to what we see on this face. So it's using the position of the polygons in the UV map to sort of define how the image is getting uh, portrayed on the on the um, on the mesh. So that's uh, number one croissant. Uh, probably not the best method to do that, but now that we have one, we can just duplicate them and then we have a ton of croissants. Okay, so I'm going to show you maybe a better method of doing that that is a bit uh, a bit less manual and a bit more um, adaptable to various circumstances. Oh, and the, the way I got this full screen view is I just hit control spacebar. So that maximizes whatever view your cursor is over. Okay, um, so that's our number one croissant. Let's put a one next to it. So I'm going to hide that and we're going to start over with our reference image 
And let's just fix this uh, this orientation right now. We're going to zero out that rotation. Um, and we are going to add, we're going to go back to our layout here. And this time we're going to add a plane. Or sorry, we're going to add, yeah, we're going to add a plane like before. We're going to scale it down. And let's pick this guy since uh, we didn't do him already. We're going to sort of start similarly where we sort of orient the plane with the with the croissant and we're going to extrude the sides but we're going to do it a lot more generally so we're going to extrude here scale it down very general shape scale it down and now we're going to extrude it upward again super blocky version Maybe this guy could be a little higher just to get the general shape of it. So super blocky croissant. Now, but now we're going to add a modifier, a subdivision surface. And you could already see what that's doing. It's just really smoothing out that shape. And if you go into edit mode, we can see uh, the original sort of shape. And at the same time, we can see the modified shape. So if I were to just manipulate this, you can see that it changes the shape of the modified version and you can get sort of an intuitive sense of how the, this worked together by just uh, playing around with it. Um, and you'll see as I add geometry, so if I were to add a ring cut here, ooh, it like, now it's, it's closer to the outside ring, right? So essentially the closer the faces and edges are to each other, the more the the shape will be restricted in that way because what subdivision does is it just, like it says, subdivides the faces. But in doing so, it also smooths them out. So if, if I didn't make it smooth and I applied this, uh, this modifier, what you'll see is that there's all these faces now that they've been subdivided up. Um, but by keeping the smooth, it's doing that, but it's also kind of trying to get the curviest shape between them. But by adding loops this way, um, or this way, you can see that you can create a more sort of rigid surface that way. But the great advantage to this method is, you know, this modifier can be turned off, or, mod or you can even add more detail if you want, or less detail, depending on your needs. And then you only have to work with a very, very simple piece of geometry to get a much more complex shape. Uh, so it can be very useful for certain things. So in this case, I'm just going to make it such that the uh, it's a little closer to the to the ground here. Uh, let's turn back on our references and we're going to add a loop cut this way. We're going to maybe scale it along the X axis. Oh, and I'll turn off my proportional editing again. Scale it on the X axis. Um, let's create some little bumps in here. So I'm just going to add some loops, scale this along the X, do that a couple more times. So it's a similar method, but you can see we get a much more natural looking shape out of it. And, um, and like in the case where let's say I add some of these, uh, I can, you know, pull this guy out a bit, add some unevenness here to our our croissant shape and we don't have to worry too much now about ex being super exact with our model because that nice smoothing out effect and i'll enable shade smoothing again really helps uh to sort of even even stuff out and uh, these modifiers can be stacked so you can then do like i will do a uh, displace and my model disappeared, but no, not to worry. That's because my strength is way too high. I'm gonna set it to zero. And um, we are gonna just displace a random number of vertices on this object. So how I'm gonna do that is I'll just finish modeling my general croissant shape. Um, 
So we're going to be using vertex groups, which are a bit advanced, actually, now that I think about it. But whatever. This is uh, this is the kind of stuff you got to do on the fly um, when you're trying to show someone how to make a croissant. So weird lumpy croissant. Um, maybe the edges are a little bit too high, actually. I will just control click, control click. There we go. It's a much nicer kind of shape for a croissant. Okay. Um, it's a bit too close to the ground here. I can bring this guy up a little. And maybe I will also take all these bottom faces or these bottom vertices and sort of squish them in just a little this way and just a little this way as well. Oh. Oh, I didn't select all of them. So yeah, another thing to note is when you select, um, it doesn't select all the way through. Like you can see that vertex there didn't get selected because it was behind this vertex. So when you're in X-ray mode, that doesn't that doesn't uh, matter. You just select everything because you're in X-ray mode. But when you're not, uh, you do have to be aware that sometimes you may not be selecting everything. So working blind is not always the best. Um, this idea. Okay, so we're going to displace a random uh, set of vertices. So what I'm going to do is select all, and then I'm going to say random, uh, select random, and because I already have stuff selected, I'm going to say deselect, so that it deselects a random amount, and I'm just going to slide it until I'm happy with, uh, with how many things, and maybe I'll change the seed just so that I'm not getting too many that are right next to each other. Or actually, you know what? I'm going to checker deselect. That's better. So that every other vertice is not selected. So checker deselect. So every other vertice is deselected. And now I'm going to go into my mesh uh, or object data properties. And we have these two sections, vertex groups and shape keys. I'm going to add in a vertex group. And essentially what this is, is, uh, well, I'm going to call these displaced verts. So that, and then I'm going to assign. And essentially what that does is if I deselect everything, now if I select this group, that's the group of vertices that I had assigned to it. So it's a way to separate out your mesh into different um, sections to do different things to them with modifiers if you so choose or need to. So now I will, um, so what the displace modifier does is it displaces the mesh using a texture. And in this case, we don't have any texture, so we're just going to add a new one. And we are going to then have to go down to the texture properties and change this to be a texture. I'm just going to add a uh, noise, um, which is black and white. And so essentially random variables, uh, random values. And I'm now going to tweak this, this strength. And as you can see, it freaks out. Um, and now it's, it's applying to the entire mesh. So I am going to do, oh boy. Direction. Oh, are our, no our normals flipped? Let me see. So a good way to check your normals, which are essentially the orientation of your faces, is by this little checkbox. And the orientation of your faces matters because if your faces are oriented inward, then trouble figuring out how to light the object because usually light bounces off of the outside faces of an object, not the inside faces. So every now and again, you might have an issue where one of these faces is like um, this, essentially, that's red. And you'll probably see it in the geometry, uh, like this, you know, like it'll be a problem <laughs> that is visible, but sometimes you won't, and sometimes you'll need to check it that way. So um, all that to say is that I thought that because the strength was negative before, that it was maybe flipped, but I don't think that's the case. So I'm going to just try and get a decent value for this. Maybe set the mid-level to zero. We're going to put 0 0.001. Okay, 0 0.005. Okay, that's too much. 0 0.002. And we're also going to restrict it to the displaced vertice. And now already you can see it's like way less intense. So I'm gonna just crank this up a tiny bit. 
maybe yeah that should be fine and I'm gonna move this above our subdivision and now you can see that it's way easier because what it's doing is you know it's pushing out these vertices but like in and then it's smoothing them out after the fact so maybe that's not what we want um, oh this is gonna look awful okay points are zero two five maybe points are zero three sure close enough a bit of bumpy you know texture on there uh, I could also add another subdivision um, on top of that so that's again the benefit of, of working with modifiers is you can just kind of stack these up so maybe I, I'll turn this down so that it doesn't subdivide nearly as much to begin with and then I can turn this setting up a little and then I get some you know uneven bumps here and there um, can also change this the texture to change the bumps a bit but I'm not going to do that um, and now again we can we can assign a a texture to this similar to how we did before but the fact that we have this modifier stack complicates things so what I'm gonna show off instead is a bit of procedural texturing um, so what that essentially means is that instead of applying an image to texture this object we're gonna be uh, doing a whole bunch of stuff with nodes so I'm gonna call this croissant texture so nodes are these things at the bottom that you can see here um, that are basically a kind of flow of information from left to right um, that end at the material output where this is what your material is. So in this case we just have a simple principal BSDF shader that's the default blender material and we have a whole bunch of inputs on this shader that can be tweaked by a whole bunch of different properties. The yellow dots are color information, the gray dots are um, black or white information as well as 0 to 1, and the purplish blue dots are vector information, so three-dimensional coordinates essentially. Um, so we are going to add for the base color a musgrave texture, which is a sort of more detailed noise texture that only outputs um, black or white data, height data. And to see what this is, we can plug it straight into the surface of the object and then we get a good preview of what is going on there. So um, as you can see, it does not look like a croissant texture right away, but if I tweak some of these settings and if I add a texture coordinate node, oops. Texture coordinate node, and I add a um, mapping node. <clears throat> I can hook up the object texture coordinates to my vector, and then my vector to my vector. And now I can just play with the scale of this stuff. So I'm going to scale it along the y axis. So that I get this kind of yeah, like these these lines, I guess these um, whatever you want to call them, and I can then again tweak this so that I maybe get a bit more variation in the the colors and stuff. And you're probably also thinking, well, why is it black and white? It should be croissant colors. Well, I'm getting to that. So we're going to then hook this not straight into the surface, but into the color. And then the BSDF output into the shade. Oh, oh yeah, the green outputs are also uh, their shader outputs. So shaders can be very complex. Or you could also just hook up a color to this and it will work the same thing. Um, OK, so we're going to add a color ramp which is essentially a gradient map, um, as you'll see. So if you just click over a, a link, it will automatically sort of hook up the node that way. So the height is going into the factor, which is then remapping to this gradient. So in this case, we could change the black color to be a reddish color or something. What I'm going to do is um, 
over here in my image viewer, I'm going to open up my croissant photo. And I'm going to go here. I'm going to hover over here and hit E. And that's going to bring up my eyedropper. And I, now I can eyedrop from anywhere on the screen. So I'm going to eyedrop this color. And then I'm going to take this guy and do the same thing in E. And eyedrop from this color. And then we're just going to add more nodes here, more, more, um, more little handles to add more colors. So I'm going to try to pick a good variety of colors here. Um, and this is looking a bit weird, I think because this white is too white. So I'm going to slide all of these over a bit. And I'm going to maybe make this guy a little darker. I'm going to actually make like slide these. Oh, and the, the reason these areas are so dark is because it's outside of the the mapping range, essentially. So no matter what I do, this will only ever be that color. I can't make it uh, like even if I bring this guy all the way over, you see it only really changes the color once I overlap that, that color there. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the brightness. I'm going to add a bright contrast node, which can, is a manipulator node for the color data. So I'm going to make it a lot brighter, but I'm going to turn the contrast. Uh, oh yeah, no, it's just, uh, yeah, no, I'm going to turn the contrast down and maybe turn the, like keep the brightness not too I may also change the amount of detail that's on this just so that we get a more even thing. Okay, so now I'm going to maybe adjust this color a bit more. Actually, I'm going to get rid of this guy and just make it... Because the shininess we can sort of get a bit later. And we could get a bit more of this unevenness uh, in the texture later as well. Again, tweaking, tweaking, tweaking. Always, um, always a thing you got to do. And sometimes, you know, color picking does not always work as you expect. So you just got to try stuff. Okay, so not looking that great, but I'm going to maybe tweak this a bit just to get a bit more variation here. Um, dement change the dimension to get slightly more smoothness between these. And yeah, all these settings, again, you, you just got to kind of tweak them to get familiar with them. Um, a lot of the time, you just got to hook it up and try to play around with it. So this is looking good, but it's too much in this direction. You can see here, they're, they're kind of going a whole bunch of ways, and there's also all these little bumps and, and stuff here. So we're gonna kind of combine this color thing with another another texture, which will be our noise. Um, and we're gonna add a distortion, because we wanna distort or displace, actually. It's called displace. Um, we are going to displace, no, sorry, it is, it is a distort, or is it texture? Hmm. Anyway. Well, if I add a math node, let's do some math. Um, we're just gonna add. We're just gonna add the noise. I thought that I was pretty sure there was a displace, but maybe not. So we're gonna add these values, and then we're gonna put it here, and we'll see what happens. 
All right, so this is not at all what we want, but um, let's maybe change it to multiply. I think that might be a little, okay. So what's happening here is the output is a black and white value, which we don't want. So we're gonna delete this, but we're gonna do something similar where we're gonna mix RGB. And here we have a multiply as well, but this is doing a full color as opposed to just a numeric uh, multiplication. So we're gonna multiply this by that and we're not going to use color we're going to use actually we're going to do this before it gets put into the color ramp because we want our colors to be consistent so we're going to take our color output from here we're going to multiply our color out from output from there and then we're going to hook that up to our um, gradient map and then we're going to hook that up to our base color okay and we're going to turn that factor way up so we can actually see what the hell's going on. So if we move this up, we can sort of see that this is being added to one extent or another. And now we, we also want to hook up our mapping so that it's sort of mapping to the same general uh, scale and, and, and stuff. But we don't want it doing the squishiness that we were doing to get those lines. So we're going to add another one of these guys and just make it uh, the scale one equal to one instead of having this Y scale. Um, so, 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 so we are going to then, so we're multiplying these two and we can switch these and you can see it's, it's slightly different. Um, but again, a lot of playing, you gotta just kind of play around, see how it looks. Okay, you can see we're now we're getting a bit more of this little bumpiness, but we want it to be more defined. So we're gonna add another brightness contrast here. And we're gonna change the brightness to be zero, contrast to be zero uh, at first, and then we're just gonna up the contrast here. And now we can see it much more easily. So this is not exactly what we want. We might want to invert this. So what we could do is instead of this being multiply, we could do divide or a number of these other set quality settings. Um, so this is not what we want, but it's pretty cool. Um, we could do a subtract. Thing. Okay, this could be useful. Again, a lot of like just trying stuff out. We can distort it a bit so that we get a bit more of a natural, uneven look. And yeah, I mean, I think I'm going to stop here because I can tweak this till the end of the earth, but already you can see that like you can sort of start getting something resembling a croissant um, through this method and quite different than our la last method we did. Um, but I mean, I think it could take just as much time doing either one, right? Like you could make, like, again, this could be, this would be great for a prop if it's in the background or something. And um, and the advantage also is because now it's, it's sort of set up with all these nodes and stuff, you could slightly modify each one so that you get a bit of variation. You could modify the texture so that they're slightly different. Whereas the other one, you are stuck with that one image. So you would have to, you would have to sort of, um, you know, play play with it to make it distinct from the other ones. So this was a lot. Um, you know, I just kind of went ham and went all out and just got really into modeling stupid croissant. But if you have any questions about what you saw, if you want to see anything specific in more detail, please let me know in the comments. And um, thank you for watching. I will see you in the next one.